Good evening and welcome to yet another lecture in our 23 lecture series for the exhibition season on Contagion. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we are Science Gallery Bengaluru, a public institution for research-based engagement with everything science, which includes the human and the natural sciences both. And the way we do it is to find interesting expressions of this engagement, which involves the creative processes behind thinking in the human and natural sciences and in art. So we are invested in scholarly work as much as we are in artistic expression. Contagion is our first fully online exhibition season. We have done three before this, two were live because they happened before the pandemic and we had a short pop-up exhibition, uh, short-lived pop-up exhibition uh, last year, again, during the pandemic. Today's lecture is supported by the Indian National Science Academy, and we are really grateful to have the support of Professor Chandra Shah and her colleagues at INSA, who see the value in bringing together a lecture series that cuts across disciplines and practices in order to help us understand in depth and through the words and experience of scholars who have worked often for decades on the topics that they speak to us about. Today, it is an absolute pleasure for me to welcome David Arnold, a senior colleague and a mentor for me as a historian of science when I was in London. Those of us in the, in the field, those of us in history of science have known David for a long time. There are many books of his that not only did we study, but we used as we taught the next generations. And so it gives me an absolute pleasure to welcome him to a lecture entitled Science and Seeing the Visual Technology of Contagion in 19th Century India. David Arnold is Professor Emeritus in History at the University of Warwick, United Kingdom, before which he was at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. He is also a fellow of the British Academy. He has published what to my mind are innumerable books on science, medicine and environment in British, and India, after in, in, in British India and India after independence. Among the many that I can name, I would like to name Colonizing the Body, State Medicine and Epidemic Disease in 19th Century India, which is relevant um, to the exhibition season um, this time. He's also written a fabulous book on everyday technologies, machines and the making of India's modernity. More recently, he wrote a book on toxic histories, poison and pollution in modern India. And I sometimes ran into him at the Welcome Collections uh, and the Welcome Library when he was working on this book. Uh, and, you know, he had coffee. I miss those days. Uh, but this is not what this evening is about. He's now writing a history of pandemics in India from cholera to COVID-19. And it's a book that I will wait for because I'm absolutely certain, again, like many of his books before, we will be able to mobilize it for teaching and for reading and for learning much more from the archive, from the historical archive. For those of you who find the historical approach interesting, um, there are many exhibits, uh, which I will speak about later after David has spoken, uh, which you could, which you could uh, visit and enjoy. Just to quickly remind you, tomorrow we have a discussion with filmmaker Arthur Pratt, who is from Sierra Leone, with epidemiologist David Heyman. David Heyman was one of the team that first went to Sierra Leone at the Congo outbreak. And so we are having this discussion between a scholar and a filmmaker and a perspective from going from the World Health Organization in conversation with a perspective from on-ground experience in Sierra Leone. Uh, we also have a lecture tomorrow evening following David's lecture in the same series on plant viruses from adversaries to allies by George Lomonosov. And critically, before I stop and hand over the uh, mic to David, we are this time making a special event to launch Contagion in Canada on Monday at 4 p.m. with Vishu Guttan from the Indian Institute of Science. All our programming is bilingual, but that's somehow not noticed as much as we would like to, and therefore this event to mark that. So without further ado, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Please do give us your feedback and join me in welcoming a senior colleague, and as I said earlier, a mentor and an important person in the, the field of history of science and medicine and environment in India. David, over to you. <laughs> 
Well, thank you, Janvi, for your very kind introduction and hello to everyone out there. Let me begin by saying just generally what my talk is about. What I'm trying to argue in this paper is that seeing is essential to science. Of all the human senses, seeing is surely the most important to science. Scientists need to be able to see, to observe, to analyze, to understand. But the question is, how do they see and what do they see? What mechanical means enable them to see or to see better? And how do they or others translate what they see into a form or message that others can then understand and appreciate? In this talk, I want to look at two particular mechanical aids to seeing in medical science as they existed in the 19th and early 20th centuries microscope and the camera. But before I turn to them directly, let me say a bit more about the question of seeing and the representation of disease. There's been a remarkable development in this past year or so in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. We have become accustomed in recent months to seeing the causative pathogen, the coronavirus, in a highly stylized form as if it was some kind of spiky ball floating through space, disembodied from the human body, unconnected with almost anything else around it. Come next slide, please. Sometimes the image appears almost playful, but as the pandemic has gone on, perhaps the image has become increasingly menacing and threatful to us all. Next slide, please. The image has become universal. It doesn't matter which language we work in. We have learned to recognize this as the deadly coronavirus. And sometimes because it is such an abstract symbol, we need to see it in relation to some other kind of visual prop like the Indian flag in order to understand where it is this coronavirus is being discussed. So it's disembodied and it's universal at the same time. Next slide, please. I'm not aware that this kind of technique of showing disease has ever existed before the last couple of years. I think some attempts were perhaps made in connection with AIDS, HIV, to use the microorganism in this way, but it certainly didn't catch on or become a powerful tool of representation. So in a sense, we're in new territory in the coronavirus and we're looking at disease in perhaps publicly a very different way from in the past. Next slide, please. Now, there are, of course, many different ways in which disease or the idea of disease can be represented, even when it comes to its visual form. For instance, as you see here, there are drawings and posters that show the outward physical symptoms of a disease or warn of its effects upon different sections of the population. In many cases, the visual image, the graphic image, is used to tell a kind of story about the dangers of a disease or the people who are in danger of catching it. But mostly, as in the case of these leprosy illustrations, we're looking at the external manifestations of a disease. Next slide, please. And we should also bear in mind that there are other kinds of visual representation which were very important in the 19th century. One of the principal ways in which the British represented disease in India at that time was through mapping. And very elaborate and sophisticated maps were produced, as on the left hand side of your screen here, by the uh, Leprosy Commission in the early 1890s. This particular map tries to draw some kind of connection between salt intake and distribution of leprosy. But it gives you a kind of macrocosmic view of disease. There's no human body involved, it's a map, but a map of the whole of India trying to work out some kind of disease correlation with some possible causative factor. And then at the other extreme, on the right hand side of your screen, you can see, if you like, a microcosmic representation of disease. This is from the uh, Indian Plague Commission. And what you see there are two charts of the temperature, the pulse, the respiration, etc., 
of two named individuals, two women, one age 70, one in her 20s. And in that case too, there's a great deal of data being produced in a more accessible visual form in order to give some idea of what a disease does. In the case of the left-hand chart, plague. In the case of the right-hand chart, uh, relapsing fever. Next slide, please. Now, let me turn specifically to microscopes, first of all. Next slide, please. Although these instruments were around in Europe for centuries before the period I'm talking about, my impression is that microscopes were not much used in India before the 1830s. At that time, microscope lenses weren't particularly strong. They didn't have much magnifying power. They were also expensive instruments. They were imported from Britain, from Germany, and other Western countries. Unlike the cameras, I will come to in a minute, not many microscopes, as far as I know, were made in India before the 1940s. Although they had some scientific and medical uses, in the period to about the 1850s, 1860s, microscopes were frequently used by relatively well-to-do Indians and Europeans as a source of amusement and recreation rather than for instruction or research, for the fascination of seeing minute things enlarged or brought to life under the microscope lens. For the religiously minded in India as in Europe and North America, this was a way of exploring the so-called inner labyrinths of creation. In other words, seeing God's work uh, through the microscope lens. Looking at pond water or sea water or the more diminutive intricate parts of plants and animals or tiny fossils as here. These were common uses in the mid 19th century. And indeed a great deal of scientific practice in India from about that time began to emerge in association with the microscope. In geology and the work of the Geological Survey of India relied very much upon the use of microscopes in botany, in chemistry, and forensic science. Next slide, please. So for example, what you see not very clearly on the left-hand side of this page is the work of an early microscopist working in botany, a man called William Griffith uh, in the 1830s in India and also in Southeast Asia. And he did very detailed microscope-based studies of the reproductive organs of various parts. On the right hand side, you see a drawing of a flea, but in a sense, this is rather important to our discussion because we know from the 1890s, 1900s onwards, that fleas were responsible, particular kinds of fleas were responsible for the transmission of contagious diseases. But there was nothing about a drawing like this to suggest that this flea was actually capable of transmitting disease. It was a curiosity to be seen under the lens it wasn't necessarily an indication of the pathogenic powers, the uh, vector status of this particular um, individual creature. So in many ways we have, in the first half of the 19th century, a rather limited use of uh, microscopes, principally for recreational purposes, increasingly for scientific purposes, but not necessarily in relation to the study of diseases. Uh, as I'm sure you are aware, 19th century India was racked by contagions of all kinds, by cholera, smallpox, plague, malaria, and so on. But most physicians didn't look to microscopes for answers as to how these diseases were caused. They looked instead to the external world, they looked to climate, to the monsoon, to miasmas, the supposedly poisonous gases from swamps and marshes or they look to aspects of human behavior, to Indians' so-called manners and customs, to mass gatherings and bathing festivals, like the Kumbh Mela, uh, once again in the news, or to slums and poor housing conditions, or to what people ate or drank to explain how diseases were caused or how they were transmitted. For colonial physicians in particular, there seemed to be something about India as a whole, about its social and physical environment, 
that best explained how diseases like cholera originated or were spread. So a rain gauge or a topical graphical survey might tell you more about a disease than looking through a microscope. Next slide, please. That began to change around the 1850s and the 1860s. And we can tell this story through two particular individuals, both of whom were members of the elite colonial Indian Medical Service. The first of these is Henry Van Dyke Carter. You see a picture of him there from later on in his life. Now Carter is an interesting figure for a number of reasons. One is that he was already a fairly well-known figure before he came to India in the mid 1850s. As a medical student in London, he had drawn many of the illustrations for that very famous textbook of human anatomy, Gray's Anatomy. And when he arrived in India in 1858 to take up a position at Grant Medical College in Bombay as professor of anatomy and physiology, he was very insistent that his students should learn microscopy. So we begin to see the introduction in the 1850s of microscopes as part of the training for medical students in Bombay, in Mumbai and elsewhere. Uh, Carter was also an active member of a medical society at Grant Medical College in which Indians also presented their work and often made use of microscopes in doing so. Next slide, please. Carter conducted his own research in the 1850s and 1860s into the 1870s, particularly as you see here into a very unpleasant fungal disease, mycetoma. Uh, this is a fungus which spreads through the feet and eventually it, it bores into the bone and the foot becomes virtually useless. What's interesting here is that uh, Carter used his microscopic technique to examine in very considerable detail, as far as the microscopes at the time would allow, the nature of this particular disease. So you see in these illustrations, the spores and the filaments by which this disease moved through the skin and into the uh, bulk of the individual's foot. But what's also interesting here, you may just be able to see Carter's name in the bottom left-hand corner, H.V. Carter. Carter was an artist as much as he was a scientist or microscopist. Indeed, he came from a family of artists in Yorkshire and his use of color was a very important part of his research and the way in which he represented the causative um, microorganisms of disease. So no photography at this time in the 1850s, 1860s could reproduce this kind of uh, detail, but also especially this use of color. However, to many of Carter's critics, and there were quite a few of them, Carter was first and foremost an anatomical artist and doubts were frequently raised about his scientific objectivity. So in other words, his science was seen to be uh, limited or contaminated by his artistic sensibilities. It was as if he was painting pictures of disease rather than providing detailed and analytical and objective scientific research. And significantly, perhaps Carter didn't use photography at all, um, but he did pursue the investigation into a number of other diseases, including relapsing fever, which was very widespread as a contagion at the time of the uh, Great Famine in Bombay and South India in the 1870s. Next slide, please. We can then fast forward a couple of days, uh, a couple of decades to Ronald Ross, uh, who, as you can see from the tablet on the left hand side, was widely celebrated for his discovery of the malaria parasites in an Anopheles mosquito in the 1890s. Now, although microscopy was still undervalued in India in the 1880s and the 1890s, Ross had the benefit of working at a time when the microscope was beginning to be used more extensively in medical investigations, following, of course, from the work of Louis Pasteur in France, of Robert Koch in Germany and others. 
So we're now very much in the age of germ theory and the recognition of the role of microorganisms in a spread and incubation of contagious diseases. But as his letters and his memoirs suggest, Ross struggled for a long time to find under the microscope the parasite, the plasmodium, that caused malaria, and at times he couldn't even see properly through the lenses that he had, and he needed advice from others, particularly from Patrick Manson in London, before he could identify the actual uh, nature of the plasmodium. Next slide, please. So what Ross uh, recorded in his laboratory notes, which you can perhaps just about see on the left there, are a series of constant changes taking place in this particular parasite, both within the, uh, the gut, uh, stomach of the uh, mosquito itself, but also in the blood samples, the human blood samples, or the bird blood samples that he was examining. So this is a long way from the very simple image we were looking at at the beginning of COVID-19 as that single spiky ball. Well, here we have a whole complex of different shapes, different types and so on uh, that Ross is trying to wrestle with. In the end, he was successful, but it was enormous physical labor as far as Ross was concerned to actually discern the nature of this parasite. Next slide, please. We can trace something of Ross's interest in the microscope and his self image in relation to the microscope through this series of photographs. So the photograph you have on the left is one of him fairly early in his career with an extremely primitive looking uh, microscope. And then as he progresses through his career, you can see greater confidence in his posture at the desk and how prominent the increasingly elaborate and expensive microscope is to his self-image. Next slide, please. So that by later in the year, in, the, in his career, you have these very large microscopes prominently displayed on his desk. So in a sense, Ross's career and his self-identity as a, uh, a medical researcher, as somebody who is innovating and exploring the new medical field, was very much bound up demonstrably with the microscope. And one of the ways in which indeed photography is acting in this context is to reflect that kind of celebratory image of Ross as somebody for whom the microscope was instrumental in creating his career and creating his international fame and repute. And indeed Ross went on to receive a, a Nobel Prize in 1902 for his work on the malaria parasite. But there is, of course, a, a danger in simply looking at these images, and that is that we see Ross as the individual hero, the white man with a microscope, as if he did all his work by himself, as if it was simply his achievement that the malaria parasite was discovered. Next slide, please. Perhaps a more realistic representation of Ross is to be seen here in Calcutta in the 1890s with various cages at his feet of the birds he was experimenting on with his wife. But also the central figure there is Mohammed Bucks. And Bucks, we now believe, was very important as an assistant to Ross uh, in using microscopes and doing much of the hard labor behind his, actually, uh, his actual research. And this is a fairly typical uh, situation in India at this time that the credit went to the European scientist, the hard work of many of the Indian laboratory assistants was often forgotten about or given only passing mention in the published work of these individuals. So the self-image of the scientist as a man with a microscope becomes a very important part of the imperial iconography of microscopes and part of the career of the camera in recording scientific achievement in this period. Next slide, please. The microscope also becomes a central part of how the laboratory is understood. The top left-hand corner, you can see Louis Pasteur working in his laboratory in the 1870s. And in a central photograph, 
You can see this is Kasuli in the Punjab Hills, the Imperial Research Institute, with a European sitting at a bench with a microscope in front of him and an Indian assistant standing behind him. But it's as if the microscope just find not just the scientific individual, but the laboratory environment in which he, and it was primarily he we're talking about, was able to conduct his work. In that sense, you have captured uh, the microcosm of the laboratory, as well as the microcosm of what the microscope actually showed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and in a way, this is the kind of imagery of disease which is possible by the 1880s and the 1890s. Even the possibility of taking a photograph of what you can see through a, uh, a microscope lens is now possible, but it's often supplemented by a drawing to make it clearer to the viewer exactly what is being represented here. But that kind of round shape, that almost globe-like shape, was always used as the visual sign that what you're seeing here is something seen through a microscope. It always becomes a kind of world in itself. All that you need to know about disease basically is compressed into that one luminous circle of light in which these parasites are floating about or wriggling about in one way or another. So the, 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 the way in which disease has been represented seemingly moved a long way from the idea of the environment, of climate, of social manners and customs to these very specific images of particular pathogens, one of which can be distinguished from another. They're not all the same. They have different visual characteristics. Next slide, please. But at the same time that the microscope and the laboratory suggested a kind of secluded space and a privileged space for science, the microscope could also become mobile. As microscopes became more sophisticated and were being used for a variety of medical, agricultural and botanical purposes, so they began to move out of the sacred, sacred space, as it were, of the laboratory into temporary field laboratories like the one on the left or even into the field, literally, where the scientists could observe things firsthand. So there begins to be a kind of mobility about the way in which microscopes are used in India. Next slide, please. And in what had previously seemed to be a world of male white privilege, we're increasingly seeing microscopes being routinized, i.e. microscopes are being used by batches of individuals looking for particular parasites or signs of disease. And this process actually happens very quickly. So although Ross had an enormous struggle to find the malaria parasite, within only two or three years of his discovery, even prisoners in some Indian jails were being recruited to look through microscopes and check for malaria parasites. So the way in which this seeing of disease happens is moving very quickly in this period. And increasingly, as you can see from the uh, cartoon of Janaki Amal, who was a uh, plant scientist, microscopes are being used by women as well as by men. They're becoming representative of Indian science and not just Western science in India. And as part of this democratization, you might be able to represent the, you might be able to uh, recognize the individual on the right hand side of the screen. Microscopes were used by all kinds of people from scientific curiosity, um, from a way of uh, coming to terms with Western science as a whole. And microscopes are also being used, as it were, uh, in other kinds of medical systems and other kinds of scientific practices. So practitioners of Ayurvedic medicine, for example, began to use microscopes in this period or subsequently. So we can talk about the microscope as being democratized. We can also talk about it as being vernacularized, about it being incorporated into various aspects of indigenous culture by the early part of the 20th century. Next slide, please. Let me then leave the microscope for a moment and switch to the camera and to photography instead. 
In some ways, the camera followed a similar path to the microscope. With the birth of photography in Europe in the 1830s, cameras began very quickly to be introduced into India, to be used by Europeans and Indians alike. And just as laboratories were beginning to be established and to become more elaborate and sophisticated, so in many Indian cities, uh, cinema, uh, 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 photography studios were also being established. Uh, the camera was being used for a variety of recreational and social purposes. It wasn't entirely clear, however, as with the microscope, exactly what contribution photography could make to medical research and to medical science. Were they scientific instruments? Did they have any value in medical science? Or were they just instruments of <clears throat> social uh, recording, recording family scenes, group gatherings, and so on? From about the 1870s in India, some attempts were made to take photographs of particular diseases. And one pioneering uh, medical researcher, for example, developed photographic images of leprosy but they weren't particularly informative images. They didn't really say more about uh, the disease than the kinds of images which were available through ordinary visual recognition or through drawings. And drawings often remain very important in representing what's seen under the microscope lens uh, because they have greater clarity, because they have greater ability to select the details uh, from what is actually to be observed. As we've already seen, photography began to find different roles for itself. It began to document and to celebrate the laboratory and this work of the scientists who work within the laboratory. So in a sense, rather than just giving you a detailed research paper or a report of a particular laboratory, you would be given an image, a photograph of the laboratory and what was happening within it. This was in a sense, a, a, a gesture, a, an emblem of the nature of the scientific research being carried out. But increasingly, as we saw in the case of the photographs of Ronald Ross, the camera and the microscope begin to work together. They begin to complement each other. You might want to say they were beginning to be in love with each other. And those images of Ronald Ross with his shiny microscope suggest something of the way in which there is a kind of symbiosis taking place between what the camera can do and what the microscope can show. Next slide, please. But the microscope had only a limited range of vision. It could only look at something small. It could only give you an image of a particular parasite. What the camera could do is to go back to that earlier idea that disease was not just a small parasite wriggling under a lens, but something which happened in societies, that it was something associated with poor living conditions, with overcrowding, with uh, masses of the population and so on. <clears throat> and this image here is from the plague uh, epidemic in Karachi in the 1890s. You can see on the right hand side of the image here, uh, five crosses inside circles, which are an indication of five people with plague <coughs> excuse me, have been identified in this particular dwelling. You can also perhaps see a soldier, uh, I assume it's a soldier, and perhaps his assistant who might have been responsible for checking on these plague cases and carrying out the inspection of similar kinds of dwellings. So in a sense, the camera is able to see disease in its environmental and social context. It goes back in some ways to that earlier idea that disease is out there in India somewhere and that it has a specific relationship to the physical and the social environment of India as a whole. Next slide, please. The camera also identifies those who are, in a sense, uh, seem to be the bearers of disease, the people who need to be uh, cleansed of their germs, the people who need to be regimented and segregated in an attempt to control a disease, a contagion like plague. 
So the camera is registering what you do with that knowledge you've acquired under the microscope. How do you get rid of these dangerous microbes? Well, one way is to douse people with detergent and stick them in the bathtubs. Next slide, please. So by contrast with the images I've just shown you, particularly the street scene, the camera could suggest a different kind of world. Instead of the supposed chaos of the marketplace or the alley in some crowded city, the camera could represent a kind of uh, remedial image. The idea that here were plague patients in Bombay in the 1890s, being looked after carefully, each with their own charpoy to uh, rest on, with a doctor and a nurse in attendance, Everything appears to be orderly and in control. It's not chaotic. You can see medicine and public health as something which represents order rather than chaos and decay. Next slide, please. And you can also see through the photograph a recording of the measures taken to deal with disease. The inoculation against plague was a common theme of the photography in the late 1890s and early 1900s. So you're moving into a world in which photography is there to record uh, the suppression of disease, not just to reveal its existence, but the means by which a disease might actually be controlled and public health and the order of public health represented be uh, established as the dominant idiom. But I just wanted to close on a rather different note. Next slide, please. So far, perhaps we've seen a kind of trajectory in which the microscope and the camera are working together to give us a much more sophisticated and nuanced and complicated notion of what contagion is about, how it might be investigated, and how it might be dealt with by certain kinds of remedial measures. But then we come to the Spanish flu, the great influenza pandemic of 1918. 1990, which, as I'm sure many of you know, was absolutely devastating on a worldwide basis, with these days estimated to be something like 40 million deaths. And perhaps as many as half of those deaths from the Spanish flu occurred in India. So a massive mortality occurring really within the space of about four or five months and affecting virtually every part of undivided India. But what is striking to me about the Spanish flu pandemic in India is that we have remarkably visual evidence of it. There are, as far as I can tell, no photographs of street scenes or people wearing masks or people in a hospital or anything else by way of a photograph to illustrate the impact of this massive disease on India. We have photographs of the United States, we have photographs of Britain, we have photographs of Japan, but for some reason, the camera is silent. The camera is not taking in images of this massive mortality in India in 1918-90. I can only speculate as to why that might have been the case, but I have no clear evidence, except that I have yet to find a single image, a single photographic image of the Spanish flu in India. At the same time, in 1918, 1919, the microscope had remarkably little to contribute. This was partly because influenza was mistakenly thought to be due to a bacillus like plague and a possible pathogen um, was wrongly identified. And it wasn't in fact until the 1930s that the true nature of the uh, pathogen, the virus behind influenza was finally identified. Now, there's a technical reason for that, in as much as many of the microscopes at the time were not sophistic sufficiently sophisticated to pick up these extremely tiny microorganisms. Larger microorganisms like bacteria, as in the case of plague, for example, could be identified, but the virus causing influenza was just too small. So, Microscopists were looking in the wrong place, and they also had insufficiently powerful tools with which to investigate this particular disease. But also in India, that 
uh, upsurge of scientific investigation in the 1890s and 1900s had been about bacteriology and parasitology. India at that stage had no acquaintance really with virology. And indeed, this didn't really develop as a specialism in India until some years later. So that's really my concluding observation that in a sense, we have here perhaps the greatest pandemic that India has ever experienced. And yet, in this instance, both microscopy and photography failed in their service to medical science. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for an engaging lecture. And I'm sure, so I see many of our colleagues in the audience already, and I'm looking forward to what their responses are likely to be and what they are going to ask you. So uh, as I said earlier, please put your questions in the Q&A box and I'll be happy uh, to take them to David. If you want to speak up, just let us know as well, put your hand up and we'll uh, find a way to let you speak. So uh, Jorge Aponte's question is, uh, I think it speaks to something you said towards the end about the lack of visuality of the Spanish flu in India. So why do we not have, or why, why according to you, do we not have that many images of the Spanish flu in India? Uh, I don't know is the simple answer. Um, as we've seen, photography in India was sophisticated there are lots of practitioners of photography there were photographic studios um, all i can think really is either there was a shortage of photographic film in mm. the aftermath of uh, the first world war but we have images of you know nationalist um, gatherings of gandhi etc from that period so i'm not sure that that's the answer it may also have been that the influenza pandemic was such a sudden um, and dramatic catastrophe. It all happened really in the case of a couple of weeks, so many people died or were incapacitated by it, that nobody was around to take photographs. I don't know. That doesn't seem to be an entirely plausible explanation. But I, I'm waiting for somebody to you know, say to me, ah, oh, you haven't found all these photographs in this archive somewhere. I'd be delighted to see those photographs. I mean, it may also be that in a sense, uh, medical science had nothing to do in reaction to the pandemic anywhere. I mean, yeah. in America, they had masks, they told people to take aspirins, etc. But there was no uh, celebratory story. There was nobody with a microscope in, in discovering this pathogen. There was nobody um, organizing um, relief measures on a large scale. So maybe the photographs simply mm. weren't there because there wasn't seen to be anything to show. And mm. in some ways, influenza was a less uh, visually dramatic kind of disease than mm. leprosy, than plague, where there are obviously signs of the uh, disease on the body, in yes. the buboes, in the lesions of leprosy, in the pustules of smallpox, etc. Mm. Uh, influenza, as it's reported, is not seen to be a particularly visual phenomenon. But mm -hmm. I think all of those answers are in various degrees inadequate, but I hope somebody somewhere will come up with these wonderful pictures of hospitals in Bombay with influenza patients in them. Hmm. I imagine there would be more like camps, right? Um, yeah. Sort of with, with hundreds of beds and uh, yeah. probably- but, but, you, but you see with, with plague, there were uh, camps to which people were evacuated. Right. So in that sense, there was something to see. There was an evacuation camp trying to look orderly with medical attendants and so on. Mm. There was very little of that kind uh, in India in 1918, 1919. But, but there were philanthropic efforts by people in Bombay, for example, to organise um, charity, relief and so on. So I'd be surprised if there weren't some photographs out there. Mm. But I don't know where. Yeah, we do have references in literature, um, yeah, um, yeah. and especially the one that is known most, or at least among my friends, uh, of yeah, Nirala yeah. and his, him losing his entire family, sure, sure, and sure. Uh, talking about 
you know the corpses on the on the banks and in yeah. the, in the Ganga, yeah. which yeah. is something we unfortunately but, but, to witness again. Yes, but but even so, considering the magnitude of the mortality, yeah. I mean, we're talking yes. about twelve to eighteen million deaths. Yes. even in the literature, there's remarkably little, and in the medical literature for India, there's you know two or three papers. So yeah. th there's no relationship between the scale of mortality, on the one hand, and the visual representation of disease on the other. Yeah, I, I, the, I was waiting to hear from, from John Mathieu because I remember discussing this with him, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring up your question and maybe you'll have something more to say, John. I'll just ask a couple of questions that came before yours. Um, so Arun Kar Gupta wants to know um, when, if we go by sort of visual evidence, can we say that the wearing of masks appears to become the norm to control the spread of disease? Uh, not until very recently, I think. Mm. Um, cer certainly if you see those um, American images or the British images of influenza, there was a recognition that masks potentially had the ability to stop the transmission or limit the transmission of that particular virus. Uh, and there are references in medical accounts to people being advised to uh, wear masks, but mm. I've no real evidence that they were widely worn in India in that uh, epidemic. Um, mm. I mean, the, the measures were pretty casual. I mean, in Bombay, for example, the cinemas weren't closed, <laughs> which now would seem pretty uh, lackadaisical, but um, you know, the, the, the measures taken to our way of thinking were pretty, pretty limited in 1918. So I don't think surgical masks were much worn in public mm. until, you know, maybe the flu epidemics of the 1950s and 1960s. Mm -hmm. That may be the time when they, they began to be used to any extent. Um, but that's, that's all I can say on that. Mm -hmm. So John's question, John Matthew's question is, uh, of course, he thanks you for a thoughtful talk. Um, and then goes on to say, we've seen major flight from Bombay in the 1890s during the third plague. The migrant guest worker crisis last year in India during the first wave of COVID-19 seemed more akin to that pandemic in terms of comparison. Was there a similar flight of which you know when it came to the great influenza, say in Bombay again, or maybe elsewhere, if not, would you attribute that relative lack of mass departure to the spread of disease, uh, to the speed of the disease coming through, or is there something else that one can speculate? Uh, that gets to be quite a complicated issue. Um, firstly, we have to recognize that the influenza of 1918 came in two waves, as in other parts of the world. Hmm. The first wave was relatively mild, and therefore many people, got it, but it didn't seem to be particularly serious, um, and therefore flight did not seem to be a necessary or appropriate response. Hmm. However, when you get to the second wave in sort of October, uh, November of 1918, there was certainly flight and absenteeism um, in places like uh, Kanpur, uh, Mumbai, Nagpur and so on. But again, the speed at which that uh, epidemic spread made it quite difficult for people to actually move. I mean, lots of people just died where they mm -hmm. were in the cities and in the villages. Uh, what's more important, I think, is the role of the army. Mm -hmm. And we're dealing in the, in the context of 1918 with large troop movements mm -hmm. into India and across India. And one of the main routes of dissemination was through soldiers, British mm. soldiers, Indian soldiers, uh, along the main railway routes, uh, through the main ports, etc. So in, in a sense, that's where the mobility of the disease particularly lies, not so much through the flight of individuals, but through the organized movement of soldiers, for example, into Punjab, and Punjab was one of the worst hit provinces in 1918. Um, mm where maybe up to a, a tenth of the population died of um, influenza. And the military connection with the Punjab, I think, is a very important factor in seeding that epidemic in the Punjab. So every, every, every epidemic, every pandemic is different, mm -hmm. but 
Uh, obviously, human mobility is an important factor, whether it's in the movement of plague or whether it's in the movement of influenza, or as we know more recently in the case of the coronavirus. Hmm. There, are, there are, of course, visual, striking visual similarities between the photographs of what happens uh, in Mumbai in 1896, 97, and the hmm. very recent um, uh, flight that he was referring to. Um, in, a, in a sense, that's very um, striking to a historian. You know, in a sense, you see the visual image of things hmm. repeating themselves. However, we historians know that things never repeat themselves exactly. So one has to be careful about saying it's the same as. Hmm. Yeah, of course, um, that brings me to the next question, but probably that the next question is going to take us to your next book, because you're one of the few people who have uh, who has written about smallpox, cholera, the plague. Um, so, you know, historical pandemics on the Indian subcontinent and uh, in great depth. So what is, you know, what is it? I mean, you know, as historians, we don't think in terms of lessons from history. So that's yeah. not the framework in which I'm asking you to yeah. comment. Yeah. But what can, you know, what can we draw by way of, you know, red threads that connect these things? I mean, you know, you, you spoke about one such thing, which is human mobility, the other, which is sort of, you know, the striking similarity of a certain kind of um, social organization, however, the, one might, or, or the ability to, you know, stratify yeah. society, etc., which plays out. Yeah. What, so how, how do you see this, you know, from, from smallpox vaccination to cholera to the plague and beyond um, in, through the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, probably also slightly earlier, um, what is it that you see? Because I, I, I imagine it's these observations that will inform your new book. So can you tell us, can you share a little bit more <laughs> about that with us? <laughs> Uh, I have to say, first of all, it's very difficult writing a book about COVID-19 when it's still happening. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a historian, that's a very different experience from going to an archive and saying, well, I'd, I'd like to see all the material about Bombay plague in the 1890s. So it's, it, it's not a finite material, but it, it's something which belongs to the past. And you can be superior about it and say, well, they should have done this and they should have done that and so on. It's very difficult. And of course, I was writing the book about COVID in that first phase when everyone, almost everyone, was saying, well, actually, things aren't all that bad in India, etc. So at that yeah. stage, one was kind of looking for differences rather than similarities. Now that we've moved you know, horrendously into a very different phase, in a sense, I find myself in a much more um, how should I say, conflicted position. Because mm. on the one hand, I suppose one recognizes that many of those diseases that I've written about in the past were very intimately bound up with colonialism, mm. with the neglect of colonialism, with its priorities about who should be looked after and so on, about the coercive nature of the intervention and so on. Mm. However, here we are in the midst of a pandemic in which a present day government with all that greater knowledge potentially at its disposal still hasn't found a way of effectively vaccinating the population, controlling the Kumbhela, um, doing all those kinds of things which the British also struggled with. Hmm. So in a, in a sense, I suppose, uh, I, I'm thinking about imperialism. I'm thinking about, you know, was the colonial uh, recipe or recipes as to how you deal with a major epidemic always wrong. I mean, do they get some things right? Are there some situations in which all governments, whatever persuasion, colonial or post-colonial, respond in similar kinds of ways, just as, you know, we now get uh, vaccination uh, skeptics as we did with smallpox and mm -hmm. cholera and plague in earlier generations in that sense, it's not that things repeat themselves, but that there is a common pattern there. Mm. Uh, it will play out in different ways, in different time spans, in different contexts. But there is something uh, recognizably similar, analogous between mm. those different kinds of um, epidemic experiences. And I mean, I, I, I hate to say this in a way, but the way in which the Indian variant of COVID is now being portrayed in the West is so like the representation of cholera oh, yeah. as Indian cholera. Yes. You know, even the images of burning funeral pyres mm. 
have a subliminal text about India being bad, chaotic, you know, all the rest of it. Um, so it's, it's really very difficult to find an appropriate balance while we're still in the middle of a pandemic between mm. how one reads the past and how one reads the present. Mm. So, yeah. I, I, the historians, I, as I say, yeah. I'm conflicted. Yes. Uh, Purbita's question to you is, could you say a little more about how um, the subjects of imperial rule conceived disease where, with the arrival of microscopes and cameras. So what was that relationship like? Do we have sources to map that relationship? Well, in, in a sense, I could have begun this talk by talking about disease deities, because in a sense, Sheetala and other disease goddesses are a kind of way of representing mm -hmm. epidemic disease. And, and in a sense, they incorporate a, a kind of memory you know, we have had cholera before, we need to propitiate the deity in order to ensure it doesn't come back or it isn't as bad as it could be and so on. So I think there's a kind mm. of folk memory and a folk imagery associated mm. with epidemic diseases. So that would be another way of introducing this particular kind of visualization story. There is a, a visual mm. trope there, which of course is still being used. I mean, some of the street art and the cartoons yes. of COVID goes back to that image of a malevolent or benign deity or a demon being mm. responsible for the disease. It, it's maybe used in a more um, uh, joking way sometimes or more allegorical kind of way, but I think that same use of a visual representation is, is very important in disease. Mm. But they, I mean, I don't think there was, if you like, a direct parallel with germ theory and the kinds of things that the microscope revealed. Hmm. But there are certainly aspects of Indian thought which suggested that there were minute, minute things in the universe and they might have a, a degree of influence over health and well-being. Um, just as when microscopes and cameras did become available, they were pressed into service in connection with Ayurveda, for example, hmm. that um, Ayurvedic physicians could use the microscope in particular to establish the authenticity of their own medical tradition and say mm -hmm. they were seeing evidence of humors or they were seeing evidence of the powers of particular drugs mm -hmm. just in the same way as western medicine did so there's a kind of um uh, equalization going on there that mm -hmm. western medicine doesn't have sole rights to the microscope or to the camera uh, these things can be transmitted across that kind of cultural divide from one kind of way of thinking about science and medicine to another. Mm. Which relates directly to the next question from Himani, who was wondering if you found, so you, you spoke to us about the difference in the kind of images captured by the camera. You know, so some of them were so recuperative, others were sort of, you know, more um, you know, making an example of so sort of punitive, yes. potentially punitive, yes. or you yes. know, the bearers of disease, etc. So, did did are you able to, from your sources, able? Uh, uh, sorry, are you able from your sources to tell who the photographers are, and if you know if there is a divide between European photographers, Indian photographers, or other kinds of photographers, and what they're looking for or what they're depicting? That that is a very interesting and complicated and largely unanswerable question. Mm. because in many cases one doesn't know who the photographs are actually taken by. It's mm. easier to know what they're taken for because they represent a certain kind of story. Um, and of course it's easy enough to think that Indian photographers take different pictures from European photographers. But the research I've done suggests that actually it's much more mixed than that. That quite a lot of the images of plague were taken by Indian photographers but mm. you have to somehow try and work out why they were taking particular kinds of images. I, mm. I actually have an article coming out about this soon. So it's, it's, it's a rather too complicated story to explain here, but you can occasionally find attributions mm. saying that these were the photographs of such and such a, uh, a photographer. So mm. there's, a, there's an Indian photographer in Bombay, uh, Shiv Shankar Narayan, Hmm. who took, I think, quite a lot of photographs of plague in that city. But most of those photographs are actually attributed to a European. Hmm. 
Hmm. So it's a very uh, complicated situation, but I think you can read those Indian photographs as presenting a slightly different story from the European story. One which is more sympathetic to the idea of a diseased deity, for example, and propitiation. Mm. One which is much more sympathetic to Indians as the sufferers of disease, rather mm. than focusing on Europeans as the people who treat disease. Mm. So it, it's very difficult because quite often, you know, you just don't know. Mm. There's a, so the, the question is posed very, very straight. I'm going to try and find a way around it. The question to you is, when will COVID end? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I'm going to try and find a historical angle on it. Because I mean, while as a, you know, as, a, as a human being living through this moment, which I never imagined I would, it's a question that you know, all of us have on our mind. Yeah. Um, at the same time, of course, you know, there, there isn't an answer. Uh, but what I would like to ask you is as follows. You've studied various pandemics in historical times, also on the Indian subcontinent. How long did many of them last? So, did, do, you know, can you tell us just, you don't have to draw averages, you don't have to do anything. Just tell us how long did, how, over how many years did the influenza play out? Over how many years did cholera play out? How many times did it come back? Well, as, as you know, there, there are two views about these things, aren't there? I mean, one is that uh, human agency is not primarily responsible for suppressing diseases that it is only when there's a change in the environment, in the nature of the pathogen itself, as it becomes less toxic or whatever the case may be, that, that that's why plague died out, according to many people, you know, not because the British or somebody else suppressed it, mm -hmm. but because the plague pathogen ceased to be as transmissible or as deadly as it had been. And you could perhaps say the same thing of cholera or TB. Uh, so that's the pessimistic answer in a sense that, uh, there is no answer that we can produce. The answer lies with the pathogen rather than with medical practitioners and public health experts. Mm -hmm. But we're in a different situation in the present time from the past. I mean, the, the, the British were fumbling around with vaccination, um, struggling to introduce it on a large enough scale and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, you know, it took them a long time to create the momentum behind vaccination against smallpox, against cholera and plague to be effective. Theoretically, uh, if things had been done better, vaccination would have provided the best route out of this pandemic. Mm. As things stand right at the moment, it doesn't look as though that's going to happen. Besides, most of the epidemics I've studied in the past were in a sense comprehensible within that Indian context. Mm -hmm. Okay, they might have come from elsewhere, they might have spread elsewhere, but we are now in such an interconnected world mm -hmm. that there are constantly new variants occurring in England, Brazil, South Africa, India, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very difficult to build a wall against those new variants. And as long as that continues to happen, and as long as those new variants are as deadly as they appear to be, then it's difficult to see how you manage that, even with vaccination on a mass scale. Mm. So I don't have an answer to your question, but there are two possible answers. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to try and summarize two questions from Varun. One of them speaks not only to today's topic, but actually to much of your work, uh, earlier work, where uh, what he's trying to ask you is, um, how did colonial or imperial medical practitioners react to Indian practitioners of Ayurveda yoga and yeah. other ways yeah. of seeing the human body? Because there were various representations of the human body. Um, yeah. And so how did that and how did that interaction, in a sense, look like? And uh, clearly, Varun is aware of you know the Welcome Collection Ayurvedic Man exhibition, etc. Uh, yeah, so that's the first question. So you know, what did that what did that interaction look like, or what was that? Uh, what how how was that perception organized? Well, the, the the interaction takes place in different ways, doesn't it? At different times, different places. But one of the reactions from Western medical practitioners and public health authorities as now 
-hmm. is there's only one way of dealing with these things. There's only one image of disease which is meaningful. There's only one system of vaccination you can employ. But also, as now, there are people who say, well, that isn't true. You know, there are other kinds of drugs we can employ. There are other understandings of the body we can employ. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure there's ever a meeting, really, of those two. That's partly why this pandemic is so fascinating in India. You know, does this mean the, the end of any meaningful alternative to Western biomedicine mm -hmm. and Western public health? Does it mean that Ayurveda and uh, religious responses and individual administration is simply not possible to deal with a pandemic of this scale? And it's partly a question of scale, I think. You know, in, in a sense, what the British did was to project an idea of public health. And I think Ayurveda and Unani have always struggled with the idea of public health. They can do personal health. They can do the health of, you know, people whom you can meet and diagnose and view on an individual basis. But I think those systems have a real problem with the idea of public health mm -hmm. as something which can be enforced by the state, etc. And it'd be very interesting to see what the outcome of that is, whether there is a failure of Western medical practice and therefore people increasingly go back to other things, mm. whether the unavailability of hospital beds, um, the unavailability of vaccines mean that people say, well, you know, we have to have something. We need to go to some kind of um, healer or some kind of healing agent. We can't just give up. Mm. And that actually feeds a kind of revival of something other than that. Mm. <clears throat> so the second question that Varun had, and this is my second last question, um, is that while there have, we've heard uh, historically accounts of people mistrusting photographic imagery, yeah, or photographs, the act of photographing yeah. as well, yeah. was are there any comparable stories about the microscope and not trusting the image? Uh, oh yes, oh yes, absolutely. I mean, for, for a long time, the, the view of microscopes was that <clears throat> uh, what you saw was totally subjective. Mm. That you know, in front of you under this microscope was a bit of pond water mm. and there were 2000 things swimming around. What, what in all of that mess was the pathogen, you know? And, and I think that a lot of the skepticism about microscopy was an inability to establish uh, one single agent within it mm. and that of course is where Pasteur and Koch are so important because they say it's definitely this thing it's this particularly wiggly thing rather than that wiggly thing which is important mm. but for a long time yeah the, the argument was always you can see through a microscope whatever you want to see you know that it, it was that open uh, and I think that held back microscopy uh, in the service of medical science in India and elsewhere for decades um, mm. And uh, it, it, is, go on. No, 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 please continue. Well, even the fact that microscope images were not very clear meant mm. that somebody had to do a drawing of what they saw through the lens rather yeah. than simply using a photograph. So you need the drawing to actually pinpoint the actual nature of a particular uh, bacterium or the nature of a particular worm or whatever the case may be. So, so drawing is the necessary gloss on yeah. the microscopic image and the photographic technique. Yeah. It, it steers you didactically towards one particular understanding. Yeah. Remi reminds me of uh, Feyerabend's, um, well, Feyerabend's story about Galileo. What did Galileo really see? Yes. Right? Like, yes. And it's, 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 not a trivial, uh, it's not a trivial question at all. Yeah. Yeah. The last question for this evening, before I also share with you a message from our colleague Christiana Bastos, who's enjoyed the discussion. The last question is from Gauri, Gauri Ghatpure, who um, is clearly a millennial and of this generation and was wondering how the information about the pandemic and its care was spread in the past with no internet and such fast means of communication. <laughs> it must have taken much longer. How were pandemics and spread of information or misinformation managed or controlled at that point of time? Well, interestingly, I think information or misinformation spread as rapidly then as it does now. That's the strange paradox that uh, rumours through marketplaces, through travellers, through family members moved at a very rapid rate. Mm. 
certainly faster in most cases than the diseases themselves. So uh, we're under some kind of illusion, really, if we think we exist in a, a world of almost instantaneous communication. There were ways in which, you know, gossip, rumours, uh, fake stories actually travel very rapidly, certainly within cities, but between towns, into the countryside and so on. So, uh, you know, for example, um, information about the plague uh, moved much faster than the disease itself and particularly information about government measures against the plague. That certainly happened much more quickly than the measures themselves were introduced. So, yeah, I mean, there was, there was a lot of um, concern. And of course, the, the, the visual signs of those diseases were often apparent. You know, rats were dying of plague mm -hmm. before people were dying of plague. So people could read that sign and say, oh, God, it's coming. You know, we're, we're faced with some terrible disease. There are lots of ways in which our age is not all that much faster than the earlier ages. Thank you so much, David, for a lovely talk and for engaging with all the questions, including ones about when COVID will end. I, I must say, as a, as a historian of science, I really enjoyed asking you that. So uh, the recording of David's lecture, along with all of the other 22 lectures, um, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel for those of you who missed today or those of you who want to share the lecture with colleagues and friends and students, do please look it up there. I trust you have enjoyed this lecture. Do explore the exhibit Drawing of the Bombay Plague by Ranjit Kanwal Gaukar, who also consulted with David when he was doing the work. Um, and he has done, so he has borrowed a lot from David's book and conversations with other historians like Prashant Kidambi and um, uh, Aditya Sarkar. Uh, Ranjit has produced an interactive drawing in which he encapsulates the various imaginations, all of the stuff that David spoke about, um, in a drawing. And on Sunday, 23rd May, he's also going to offer a workshop. For, so those of you who are young, between the ages of 15 and 28, you can actually join him in the workshop to learn about what it meant for him as an artist to do some good old history and archival work. Uh, do also look at the work of another colleague of ours, Christos Linteris, uh, whose work Controlling the Plague in British India uh, contains some of the photographs that David spoke about. So I think, uh, uh, I think a photograph or two is repeated there and, then, and he also has some other photographs uh, of disease prevention and control measures taken by uh, the, the government of British India during the third plague epidemic, which was the first plague epidemic to be photographed extensively and actually at all. Um, these photographs are accompanied by a historical essay by Christos, so do attend his talk as well. Uh, his is more focused. I think what David has given us is a broad view um, because he has just pretty much worked on every epidemic of 18th, 19th and uh, early 20th century India. Uh, Christos is focused on plague and the emergence of epidemic photography. Uh, and he'll speak on Sunday, the 29th May at 6.30 in the same, same time slot. Do please show up for that lecture too. If, uh, and I, I trust even those who are practicing scientists in the audience will find that we historians have interesting things to say to you. Do fill the feedback form as well and let us know how you enjoyed this lecture, what else you'd like to see and uh, register for our programs and visit the exhibition site. That's the most important thing. Thank you again, David, for your indulgence, for your engagement and your continued support. Look forward to the next time we can have this conversation. Have a lovely evening and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.